hello welcome or welcome back my name as always is Ari and this week I am reading my February arcs now for some reason a lot of books that are expected to be fairly popular in 2024 are releasing in February and I was approved for seven arcs so I'm gonna do a seven books in seven days type of things to read all of these arcs start out the month strong. For right now I'm gonna tell you what all the books are and what date they publish. On February 6th we start out with two books and that is The Tainted Cup by Robert Jackson Bennett and Your Shadow Half Remains by Sunny Moran. Then four books on February 13th. I have The Book of Love by Kelly Link, The Book of Doors by Gareth Brown, What Feast at Night by T. Kingfisher, and The Warm Hand of Ghost by Catherine Arden. And then finally on February 27th, Lore of the Wilds by Annalise Sabrin. Now these books vary vastly in length. The shortest is 160 pages. I do have two novellas on here and the longest is 640 pages. So before I jump into reading them I want to think about the best way to do this to get these seven books done in seven days. For me it makes sense for the two longest books to be Saturday and Sunday, right? Because I'm gonna have way more time. I don't work weekends two longest books should be Saturday and Sunday and I'm going to do the longest book on Saturday which is The Book of Love and then Sunday The Book of Doors. I love that these two books sound so similar and I think they're like vastly different premise but The Book of Love is 640 pages, The Book of Doors is 416 pages. That's not actually the longest or the second longest. The Book of Love is the longest, The Book of Doors is the third longest. I'm gonna start the week with the second longest book. So Monday is going to be The Tainted Cup by Robert Jackson Bennett and then Tuesday is going to be the shortest book. So if for some reason I don't have enough time on Monday I have part of Tuesday to read it and then just a short novella to make it for the time. So that's at least how it's going to work best in my mind. And the shortest novella is What Feast at Night by T. Kingfisher. I know I can get through that one very quickly because I'm used to reading T. Kingfisher and I know how quickly her books read for me. So Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday I have two like 300 page books and then uh, the other novella easily enough to do on a weekend evening after I get off work that is The Warm Hand of Ghost, Your Shadow Half Remains, and Lore of the Wilds. So right now I'm going to jump right into reading The Tainted Cup. I will come back shortly and give you a synopsis of what it's about and then like talk about what I think about it and if you should maybe pre-order some of these books. We are starting out strong, strong with The Tainted Cup by Robert Jackson Bennett. So there's this TikTok sound that I keep hearing that's like, what book did you know within the first 20 pages was going to be a five star? And this book fits that sound perfectly. This was so good. I requested this arc because this book showed up on a list of most anticipated releases or most anticipated fantasy releases for 2024 on Goodreads. I pay attention to these lists because these Goodreads lists kind of give you a sneak peek to what's going to show up on the Goodreads Choice Awards every year and because fantasy books end up being so long the more that I can read ahead of time the better. I saw the list that they put out the first of the year and then requested all of the arcs. You're going to see quite a few of those arcs on this video but all I knew about this going into it was it was fantasy and most anticipated of the year. I have never read anything by Robert Jackson Bennett before though I've heard of his Foundry side series, I think it's called the Founders series, but I've heard of those books, never read them. And I didn't actually look at the synopsis of this book before I requested it. I was just going off of most anticipated, honestly. <laughs> what this ended up being is a Sherlock Holmes-esque 
murder mystery set in a fantasy world. Our main perspective character is this kid named Din, and Din is an apprentice investigator a la the Watson. He has magical abilities that basically give him a photographic memory and so that's what he does is he goes and sees everything and then tells Anna who is the Sherlock character like what's going on and then she comes up with these like wild conjectures that end up solving the case right? I didn't realize my hair was doing this. Anna is the perfect amount of weird and bitchy for me. She is like ideal unlikable female character even if she's not the perspective character. She is easily my favorite character in this book and I think her character did a whole lot to sell this book as a five star for me but she is not the only thing I loved about this. Well, this investigation starts because a man has been murdered. He is found in a manor house with a tree that has exploded out of his chest. I mean what a freaking setup to a story. The world building in this book, fantastic. The setup for this book, fantastic. The characters in this book, fantastic. I've never been interested in a murder mystery in my life. Like I've never heard the plot for a Sherlock Holmes or an Agatha Christie and been like I really want to read this but I was sold. I don't think I'm gonna go into murder mysteries. I think I needed the fantasy setting for this to make it something I enjoyed, but I liked the murder mystery in this. Who would have thought? Basically give me a interesting fantasy world, a well-written unlikable female character, and the tiniest little sprinklings of the start of a gay romance, and I am sold. Five stars. Just five stars across the board. We're starting this video strong and I don't know if the rest of the books in this video are going to be able to keep up with how strongly this started. This book was so good guys. I need to go back and read all of his other books now. Shit, it's a lot of books. Positive thoughts only. Let's go into T. Kingfisher. Same shirt because it's the same day. It's Tuesday evening. That took me like two hours to read maybe. So uh, I'm a little bit ahead of my reading which is always good. Let's let's start ahead instead of starting behind. I just finished What Feast at Night by T. Kingfisher. This is the second book in the Sworn Soldier trilogy series. I don't know. I don't know how many books there are going to be, but this is the second one and there's probably going to be at least one more. This series follows gender non-conforming former soldier Alex Easton through different horrifying situations in the late 19th century, like 1880s, 1890s. Alex is as I just said a soldier suffering from PTSD, but they're going through some like really rough experiences in these stories. The first book is a retelling of the fall of the House of Usher. This book is not a retelling of anything as far as I can tell, just a continuation of Alex and Alex's companion's story in a different setting with kind of other horrific things. So this one takes place at Alex's inherited hunting lodge and the they're out there so their mushroom studying friend can kind of study mushrooms. They show up and find out that the caretaker has passed away and that the hunting lodge may be haunted by a ghost that sits on your chest and steals your breath. Is this just folklore, fairy tales, people catching pneumonia and just seeing things, having bad dreams? Like what's what's really going on here? And if it is a ghost, why? Why is it doing this? As I said, it is very short. I'm not gonna really say anything else. Read it for yourself. 
it's T Kingfisher so it's worth it. I'm gonna give this like a four star because I wanted more. It just didn't feel like enough to me. I want more. Give me, give me more. Going in tomorrow I'll be reading another horror book by another author that I've already read from and enjoy and that is The Warm Hands of Ghosts by Catherine Arden so I will check in tomorrow and let you know how that one went. It is Thursday morning. I did finish Warm Hand of Ghosts yesterday but it was late once I finished so I, I waited until this morning to talk to you about it. Warm Hands of Ghosts is historical fiction? It's historical historical fantasy. We'll go with historical fantasy, but it starts out reading like a historical fiction from World War One. We have two perspectives. We have Laura and Freddy. Laura is a wartime nurse, a very successful, very decorated nurse, and then Freddy is her younger brother who is kind of a generic soldier. Freddy goes missing uh, in the front in the trenches and is presumed dead and Laura sets out to figure out what happened to him because the situation around him going missing and how they've reported his death to her is very confusing, very weird. It doesn't really make sense. So she wants to go talk to people in person and figure out what happened. And although we do read from Freddie's perspective, we don't know what happened to him either because Laura's perspective chapters are in 1918 and Freddie's perspective chapters start in 1917. So even though we're reading from his perspective, we're reading like a year before or at least a few months before. I personally adore Catherine Arden's writing and I will read any adult novel that she writes just to experience her writing, even if I'm not particularly interested in the subject, which a World War One historical fiction definitely qualifies as a subject that I'm not particularly interested in. I am not a historical fiction girly and I struggled through the first half of this. It's short so I read it in a day but I, I struggled getting into this a little bit. I also wondered when is the fantasy part going to show up? And the answer is 50%. About right around the 50% mark is where it starts to actually get fantastical. The fantasy aspects before the 50% mark you can definitely chalk up to uh, like fever dreams and stuff like that but 50% is where it's like oh okay I see the fantasy in here and it's hard to tell you what the fantasy is when it doesn't show up till 50% because it feels like spoilery but in the most general sense that you could probably get from the title We've got ghosts and like devils. The last 20% of this book I was absolutely sold bawling my eyes out. Just World War I is tough and it is very sad and everything is bad for obvious reasons I would hope. Overall this is a fantastic portrayal of the hell that is war and how love can pull you through the hell you're going through but doesn't necessarily leave you whole. Even though not a historical fiction girly, not a world war anything kind of girly, I still end up giving this four stars. Catherine Arden is just that kind of storyteller. So if you're a big fan of her Bear in the Nightingale series, you may not like this to start with but I think if you can push through and finish it you'll be glad you did. Again it is Thursday. I am moving on to my second novella on this list. So this is the second shortest book. I should be able to finish it fairly quickly this evening. So far I've had a five star and two four stars. So doing great as far as like how much I'm enjoying these arcs. But this is where we kind of depart from all of the authors that I know of. Everything I have left is authors I've never read from before. I don't really know their work so I don't know how some of these things are going to go. Hopefully great. Hopefully we continue this trend of all of these books being like four and five stars. Like that would be amazing but I don't know. Let's 
start reading and find out. I finally got a book that I didn't particularly care for. This is Your Shadow Half Remains by Sunny Moran. This is a novella, so I'm going to try to keep the synopsis succinct so we don't spoil anything in case you want to read it because just because it wasn't for me doesn't mean that it can't be for you. This is like post-apocalyptic dystopian where a where something's happened where if you look into another human's eyes you instantly uh, just become murderous. You either murder the person you're looking at, they murder you, or you you just die a few minutes later. Like, all of your internal organs go into failure. So if you make eye contact with another person, you're dead. Our main character is just like a regular girl. She assumes it's eye contact, but it's never actually been proven. And she winds up in like her grandparents lake house years after this epidemic started uh, one of the few remaining survivors on earth and she's just it's kind of like a day-to-day -day type thing there's not a whole lot of days it's like 160 pages it's a very short novel and a, a neighbor a new neighbor moves in like a, down the road next door i'm not really sure it's not very clear but we are just experiencing a day-to-day -day life with her and like her struggles with this forced isolation. I love post-apocalyptic stories. I love this kind of story and like the plot and everything like that, great. There is no answers in here. The ending is very open-ended so if you hate all that stuff you probably won't like that. I love all that kind of stuff so I was super excited to go into this book. My specific problem with this book is the main character gives edgy teenager vibes. Like, she has to be in her late 20s, early 30s, just based off the, the timeline that we're given in the book. Because she was a full-on adult when this hit, already living on her own. And then it's been years later. So why does she behave like an edgy teenager? And when I say edgy teenager and it sounds kind of insulting, it, it's kind of meant to be. Like she feels so young and thinks she's like cool and edgy. But any adult is like, oh, bless your heart, sweetheart. <laughs> that, that's kind of like the first probably 20 pages that was my reaction was, oh, bless your heart, sweetheart. And then reading 160 pages of the same thing just wasn't for me and it was entirely like everything else about the story I liked. I just didn't like the authorial voice of the main character. I guess that's not really true. There was something else that I didn't like hate but I had a hard time relating to was like how this character dealt with isolation. I would excel. <laughs> at isolation. I can go months without talking to another human being and I've done it before. So in like in this world like the internet still exists. You can have online friends and you can talk to other people you just can't look in their eyes and I would not have the same reaction this woman did to this kind of isolation. Like honestly, I'd probably be dead by this point, but in the off chance that I had survived, I understand but don't feel the same way about how she handled isolation. I understand that people are not very good at isolation as a general rule, but I am. <laughs> I'm gonna give it a two. Like, I think there is an audience for this. I am just not that audience. Let's move on to the next read, which is a wild flip. You're going from dystopian horror to fantasy romance. Lore of the Wilds is next up. It, it is Saturday. It is time for the big book today. But first, we need to talk about Lore of the Wilds. Lore of the Wilds is a fantasy romance from a debut author and it is fairy romance. 
following a young woman named Lore who lives in a human village that's kind of like trapped in by the Fae who absolutely hate humans. Like violently hate humans. Something really bad happens to the village and Lore makes a deal with a Fae Lord in order to save her village that involves her going into a cursed library that Fae can't enter and then she's trying to find some or clean up the library and find some books and then it it devolves from there. <laughs> I wanted to love this book so bad. I I really really wanted to love this book so bad but I did not. <laughs> I will say that the story I felt was told in a very similar way to Cruel Prince like the plot the characters like that stuff wasn't the same at all but like the way the story was told like the pacing and the like coming out of left field surprises very similar to The Cool Prince and I hated The Cool Prince but most people like that series so I think the series is going to be a lot more popular because of that comparison and it's just I'm going to be an outlier on how much I dislike this story. If I try to go through the story and explain everything I hated about this it would be just a mismatch of confusion and tangents so I'm going to try to like list off like the main topics. Uh, first off I I don't understand. I, I don't understand anything. The plot was all over the place and I don't understand how anything worked out the way it did, where these things came from. It, it was so confusing. Most of the book I spent asking questions like, why would she do that? H how? What? How does that? What just happened? <laughs> and if you saw my face, I wish I would have recorded it, but if you saw my face while reading this I would just go like... Because <laughs> I, I didn't know what was happening. I could, like the plot's not difficult, I could follow it, but how point A got to point B lost me. It reads very young. I thought this was YA until there is a full-fledged sex scene with graphic details on page. So do, do, I mean, unless you want your teenagers to read about sex, which is fine if that's your choice, uh, th this is definitely adult. It just reads younger. There are a lot of plot holes. I think I've established that point already, but just to, just to clarify, there are a lot of plot holes. I'm also not even vaguely sold on the romance. I don't understand why these men, because it's a love V, but I don't understand why they're attracted to Laura at all. And the only reason I can see her being attracted to either one of them is she's not used to people being nice to her, which is a really bad reason to have a romance. It's like, oh, this man is nice to me. I'm in love with it. Please don't do that. Like, see a therapist not fall in love with the two men who were nice to you. On that note, a content warning where after discovering a huge group of women who have been essayed repeatedly, two lore and one of the male main love interests decide to make out and almost have sex outside of the window. And that gave me the ick. Like that's not a situation where you do something like that. And I could nitpick a lot of other things, especially with the main character, uh, but let's just suffice to say that I really did not enjoy this book. That's not to say it's all bad. Like yes, I had a lot of individual problems with it, but the book itself isn't like the worst thing I've ever read. And I do think a lot of people will like it. Uh, first off, it's super fast paced. Like there is always something happening. There is always something to be engaged with. There is always action happening. You're not gonna have like a lot of downtime uh, for the world building or like getting inside feelings or something like that. You always going to be in the action. Lore is super sweet. She is the, she is a cinnamon roll of a character and 
like no matter what bad things happen to her she is cheerful and happy and she stays that way which is which is lovely you also get a bit of the grumpy sunshine trope i know a lot of people really like that it, it doesn't do much for me either way but i do know a lot of people really like that so it does exist in here even with this being like humans and fairies it is a unique world with a unique concept it's not widely explored in this book but it could be further in this series and it is a very unique concept and the representation is great every single character in this book is black and there are some queer characters uh, side characters that are queer so if you're looking simply for nothing but representation this one definitely has it i do think that this is worth giving a try like if you can pick it up from your library or maybe read like a couple of chapters on Amazon or whatever before you buy it. But if you pretty much don't like it right from the beginning, it's not going to get better for you. If you're reading it and you're 20% in and you're like, oh no, I'm enjoying this, then you'll be fine throughout the entire book. But if you're like me where I was like five pages in and I'm like, I don't think I'm going to like this, it, it does not get better. It does not. All right, so that's two back-to-back -back two stars <laughs> going into the longest book on this list. I'm a little worried. I will reserve the right to DNF anything I need to DNF at this point. I really should have DNF'd Lore of the Wild, but it is what it is. It read really fast. That's why I didn't DNF either one of these last two books is because they read so fast. Like it was like, oh, whatever. I don't like this, but it's going to take me another 20 minutes to finish it, so I might as well finish it. Today's book is The Book of Love by Kelly Link, and it is 640 pages, so I'm going to jump right in and start reading that, and uh, hopefully it goes well. I guess we'll find out. Okay, I am coming at you with a double DNF update, but DNF for two widely different reasons. Let's start with The Book of Love by Kelly Link and this is a very very long book. It's like 600 something pages and it's very whimsical, very weird, a la like the Starless Sea. If you like that kind of whimsy, this has a lot of those same vibes but it's a different story. This one's a little bit darker. Three like almost adult children, senior high school age children find themselves inside one of their teacher's classrooms one night almost a year after they went missing. They were dead and somehow have seemed to escape from whatever limbo they were in. They are given the chance to reunite with their friends and family and they have to participate in some sort of contest. They are given a series of magical tasks by these godlike beings, and if they complete the task, they can stay alive. If they don't, then they have to go back to where they came from, what, whatever limbo they came from. Their resurrection has brought a lot of other supernatural cr creatures to the town that they live in and just some really weird things are happening. I'm about 30% of the way into the book and we haven't even gotten to the first task yet, but I am temporarily DNFing this one because I'm enjoying it immensely. This is exactly the kind of book that I like to read, but it's a kind of book that I want to take my time with. I want to read over quite a few days and not try to rush it and cram it all into one day. I like to read a chapter and then kind of think about what happened. Uh, and you can't do that when I have to read 600 pages in a single day. So I'm going to DNF this until March when I don't have any like video plans or anything like that and then go back into it and then take my time with it. But so far 30% into this book I am immensely enjoying it. It's just not the type of book meant for a quick read if that makes sense because it's it's fantastic it's everything that I love in a book it will probably be five stars once I complete it I just don't want to rush through it so I'm not going to because it's my life and I can do what I want that brought us to Sunday 
The Day That I Just Didn't Feel Like Recording, and The Book of Doors by Gareth Brown. This again is a DNF but for a wildly different reason. This is a I don't like this, I don't want to read it kind of DNF. So let's start out with a synopsis. I only got about 5% into this book, so I am going to read the synopsis based off of like what they're telling me the synopsis is, but I didn't experience any of this. I'll talk about why I didn't like it here in a second. So this follows a young woman named Casey who works in a bookstore that has like a cafe in it. One of her favorite customers, a lonely old man who comes in at the end of the day and she like chit chats with him as she's closing up, uh, he just passes away of old age. And I did experience that within the first 5% of the book. Like that happened like literally right from the beginning. He leaves her a book and it's like dedicated to her and it, it's it's really weird. I don't know what this gets into. I just know that she found the book and she took it home with her. And apparently people really desperately want this book. It's like a magical book that any that makes any door every door. I didn't get into that, but apparently her and her roommate are trying and like some mysterious dude are trying to protect the book against evil people. <laughs> like I said, I didn't get into that. I'm just reading the synopsis here on my screen. What I did get into and what I don't like is everything I read up to the 5% point. Now when I went to go review this book, because it's a NetGalley book, I still have to review it even if I don't complete it. I read a couple of other reviews, um, especially the two one and two star reviews, and apparently this is going, even though I didn't experience it, it's going to be very fat phobic and racist coming up, which it seems to be a character or characters who are fat phobic and racist, but it also doesn't seem to be necessary to the story, which I hate. Let's start with what I experienced, and first is the dialogue. The dialogue reads like a baby writer writing dialogue. It doesn't read like two people having a conversation. It reads like somebody writing dialogue. Like English 101 writing dialogue. And it was very hard to read because you felt like you were reading a book. With a good book, with good dialogue, you can get into that story and just be lost in the story. This one clearly felt like I was reading a book. And I, that was like a strike one. And I was thinking like, I'm not going to enjoy this experience. And it's probably not going to be more than a two star based on dialogue alone. But I'm going to give it a shot, get at least like 50 pages in, see if the dialogue improves or gets better. If I can get into the story even with the bad dialogue, but I didn't even make it that far because other things happen. And we're going to do a three strike you're out kind of thing here because <laughs> I have three things that bothered me. Problem number two, men writing women. If you know, you know, but if you don't know, some men don't see women as human beings and they write women how they see women, which is not how women think of themselves. There's just something off about how the ladies in this book are thinking. It's like, that's not how women think. That's not even how people think. It's how men who write women think women think. My third strike, my third offense that was like, okay, I'm putting this down, I can't do this anymore, uh, are the random offensive statements that have really nothing to do with the plot. They seem to be there for the sake of being offensive or racist or phobic in some way. And it's just like, why? Why was this said? What does that have anything to do with even the character? Like even if you're trying to make a character a bad guy, there's better ways to do it. And this could be 
like setting up for these characters personality and maybe that's perfect like maybe this is a perfect example of what these characters because it was two separate characters who did this and maybe this sets up their personality perfectly but having to read these things when it's already a unenjoyable experience just makes it worse. The statements come across as something like a self-professed conservative would say in order to be called on their bullshit and then be like, oh, you're woke. Oh, woke culture, woke culture, which is annoying at best. But it's just statements that should be called out that people know they're doing something wrong when they say them. They just want to be mad when they're called out about it. Let me read you some of these examples so you can get a better feel about what I'm talking about. Cassie gets home and asks Izzy how her day was and asked her why she was home early because she figured she was going out. Izzy says, we went to a few places, couple of guys tried to pick us up in the last bar we were in. This big guy tried to use his charm on me. He was horrible. All muscles and monobrow. He suggested that we go to Times Square together and watch the lights. Who the hell wants to go to Times Square? The only people interested in Times Square are tourists and terrorists. I said that to him. Nobody cares about Times Square except tourists and terrorists. He acted all offended like I said something awful. That's so disrespectful. You know terrorists kill people. What? What? <laughs> and Cassie's response is, that's pretty special. What? <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I hope my description of those examples give you a taste of why I wasn't really into this book. Uh, and instead of continuing complaining about the literal 20 pages of this that I read, uh, let's end the video here. Thank you for coming along on this seven books in seven days attempt that I made. If it helps, even though I DNF the two at the end, I did end up reading another book on Saturday and even though it wasn't an arc it is not featured in this video I did read six books in seven days so only slightly false advertising going on here. Next week we're doing the romance thing so if you want to see my annual video where I read romances tune in for that. It's going to be a little different this year. So I'm excited. I hope you're excited. Thank you for being here and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!